Welcome to a reflection on the Stations of the Cross for Good Friday. My name is Padraigo Tuma. I'm a poet and a theologian, and I have loved the Stations of the Cross for many years. I started doing them, I suppose, on a regular basis at the age of 19, wandering around them. I had an old prayer book. I used to read out one prayer from it. And then, as time went by, I found my own relationship with those stations. At times I've come to them in sadness, at times I've come to them in defiance, at times I've come to them needing power, at times I've come to them needing to change. Stations are a series of 14 images that depict small scenes from the time when Jesus of Nazareth was condemned to state torture and death by execution by Pontius Pilate on behalf of the Roman Empire, to the time when the family of Jesus laid his body in the tomb a tomb donated by a secret admirer of Jesus of Nazareth. The stations weren't um, uniform for many centuries. There were 11 in some places, 17 in others. These days, most places have 14. The only formal requirement for a Catholic church anyway is to have 14 simple crosses, like you see in this Viennese church. Other denominations across various Christianities also mark the stations. Some places mark stations using different ones, the received stations, the 14, are some from lifted directly from different gospel accounts, some of repetition, like Jesus falls three times, some from the tradition, like Veronica wiping the face of Jesus. I'll be following the 14. Many places do have images or small sculptures or pictures for the stations. I'm going to use some images, all photos that I've taken over the years. The details will be on the side of the images. What you see here are semi-abstract stained glass stations of the cross and I'll be using these um, at least in all of the 14 stations we reflect on as well as some others. These ones come from the Church of Our Lady, Queen of Heaven, a parish church in the grounds of Dublin Airport. Andy Devane was the architect. The building was completed in 1964. And the artist for these beautiful stations is Sheila Corcoran. As you see, they're in vibrant colours where the light shines through. Stained glass, they reach about a foot square, maybe a little bit bigger. Before looking at the stations, I think it's important to speak about the violence of them. Perhaps this should come with a trigger warning. The crucifixion certainly is not something that should be taken lightly or should be taken easily. Jesus of Nazareth, a man from Galilee, was tortured and executed by Roman powers. And the Christian scriptures aren't really sure about how to speak about what this means. People speak about atonement theories. There's at least four or five or six. But certainly the actions of Jesus of Nazareth in going towards death are spoken of as a demonstration of love. But why or what it does do, if anything, is debatable. These days I tend to think of the crucifixion as being an apocalypse, the pulling back of the curtain, showing us the predictable plots of empire. Empire always seeks to dominate and murder for the sake of itself. Whatever it needs, it takes, especially lives, and then it tells lies about what it's been doing. Empire hides in subtle ways. Empire gets other people to do its own work, divide and conquer. Jesus of Nazareth died a hollow death, like countless before him and after him, and I find myself sometimes in and sometimes out of the Christianities that I know, but something that never fails to move me is that the proclamation of Christ crucified is an accusation toward a dominant power, not an adoration of a torture device. If the cross does anything, it shows you that empires will always go in one way and that the witness of this strange man from Nazareth was to resist empire with love, even if it kills you. Another thing to think about carefully when it comes to the question of the death of Jesus of Nazareth is the question of Judas Iscariot. He's often spoken of as the betrayer of Jesus, the one blamed for the death. Here we see him depicted by the famous Irish stained glass artist Harry Clark. We see Judas naked and burning in hell, being seen by St. Brendan, who seems to be speeding through the boat with wind in his hair, speeding through hell with wind in his hair. When it comes to thinking about who Judas was, I'm not entirely sure that I um, trust the gospel narrators to be reliable, 
speakers about who Judas is. They each introduce him in such particular ways. The one who betrayed him, who betrayed him, who became a traitor, who was going to betray him. Even when another character called Judas is introduced, it's, the Gospels go to pains to make sure that it says uh, Judas is, but not the Iscariot. But Matthew, interestingly, the preachiest of all Gospels, yet also the one concerned with justice, is really interested in portraying something different about Judas towards the end of Judas's life. Judas had um, seemed perhaps to want to start off a revolution. Maybe he thought that Jesus was interested in doing something good, but he needed a push into political life. And then Jesus is arrested and it's clear that he's going to be murdered. And this is how Matthew speaks about what Judas sees and what Judas does. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So there's more to Judas. This word, repented, is so important. It means to change your mind or change your direction and is at the heart of it the call of Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospels to anybody who's listening to change the way you act in the world, to change the way that you use power for your own power, to become in a certain sense a demonstrator of a power of love, a power of inclusion, a power of listening to people on the margins and a power of not believing lies that pretend that they're not exploiting. Judas, sainted scapegoat, when you saw that your friend was condemned, you repented and ended yourself. We pray for all who are on the edges of themselves. We pray that they may not be alone. We pray that they may not betray their deepest dignity, because God gathers all on the boughs of the beloved. Amen. As we go through the 14 stations, there's two or three images per station that I'll use. For some I'll say something, for others I'll say little, but I will um, read out a collect. And collect is an old form of prayer with five beautiful folds. During this time of coronavirus, so many of us are isolated from each other and from practices and faith traditions. And this is an invitation into calm and ease as we go through them. It's an invitation into an intention that you in the face of power, can show love, little and large. That I, in the face of power, can show love, little and large. That we all can. Because love, we hope, is stronger than death. And even if it's not, well, I suppose it's not a bad way to die trying. This, I think, is one of the messages in the practice of the stations. First station, Jesus is before Pilate. God of the accused and the accusing, who made the mouths, the ears and the hearts of all in conflict, may we turn toward that which must be heard, because there we will hear your voice. Amen. Station two, the cross is put on Jesus' shoulders. Burden God, who bore the weight of wood on torn shoulders. We pray for the torn and the burdened, that they may be held together by guts and goodness. Because you were held together by guts and goodness. Amen. Station three, Jesus falls for the first time. God of the ground, whose body was like ours from dust, and who fell like we fall to the ground, may we find you on the ground when we fall. O oh, our falling, fallen brother, may we find you so that we may inhabit our stories ourselves. 
Amen. Station four. Jesus meets his beloved mother. Mary, mother of failure, you met your son at the end in a place beyond words and must have felt faithless and empty and alone. We pray that we may have the grace to live with our own stories of failure, knowing that love can continue even when things end. Amen. Station 5, Simon of Cyrene helps Jesus to carry the cross. Simon of Cyrene, stranger from afar, you were a help to an unknown man. We pray for all who help, that their help may be helpful, that their kindness may be kind, because yours was even though you knew you couldn't do enough. Amen. Station 6. Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. This station is worthwhile reflecting on. It comes from the tradition rather than being narrated in any of the Gospels. The name Veronica, Vera Icone, means true image, and often there's stories of whatever um, was left on the cloth that Veronica used to wipe the face of Jesus bore his image, which on the certain sense might be simply true. A person with blood and sweat all over their face is likely to leave an image if they press their face into a cloth. Veronica, your story is doubted but valuable. You did what you could, even though it was very little. May we do the same, even when we doubt. Amen. Station 7, Jesus Falls the Second Time. God of the Fall, you felt the fall when your body fell to the ground a second time. Gather all who fall. Gather all our fallings. Gather the voices. Gather the breath that's forced from our bodies. Because falling too has a story. Amen. Station 8. Jesus comforts the women of Jerusalem. I often find this a strangely named station because Jesus speaks words of anxiety to them. I'm not sure that he comforts them, but certainly he, a person in empire and wartime, speaks to women here of empire in empire and wartime. There's a strange kind of comfort in telling each other the truth during times of particular stress and war. And I think this is one of the things that's captured here. Women of Jerusalem, while you mourned, Jesus saw you and spoke to you. He, in his sorrow, seeing you in yours. May we see each other, even when we feel unseen, because when we see each other, we are seen ourselves. Amen. Station 9, Jesus falls for the third time. Jesus of the dirt, you were led to death because of how you lived. Help us live like this, walking and falling and walking and falling like you in the ways of the living and the dead. Amen. Station 10, Jesus is stripped. So many of the depictions of Jesus 
being crucified, show him with a convenient loincloth. Here in Richard Campbell's work from the Church of Reconciliation in La Perouse in Sydney, we see a depiction of a naked Jesus, which is an accurate depiction about how people were crucified. Jesus of the flesh, naked you came from the womb, and naked you were made for the cross. What was designed for indignity and exposure, you held with dignity and defiance. May we do the same, because you needed it, because we need it. Amen. Station 11, Jesus is nailed to the cross. The cross is such a received image across the world. It's important to remember it was a torture device. Jesus of Nazareth, this cross was a torture it only gives life because you made it hollow. Bring life to us, Jesus, especially when we are in the places of the dead, because you brought life even to the instruments of death. Amen. Station 12, Jesus dies. Jesus of the imagination, you never grew old, always a young man, and most of us grow older than you did. When lives are cut short, the living question the meaning of living. May we live with meaning, even when meaning fades, making meaning so that we have something to live for. Amen. Station 13, Jesus is put in the arms of his mother. Mary, mother of death, you held the corpse of your young son, the worst of fears, in your arms as he went where we have not yet gone. We mark this with silence and art. May we also learn from fear, because fear won't save us from anything. Amen. Station 14, the final station. Jesus' corpse is put in a tomb. Jesus of the unexpected, for at least some of your life, this was not how you imagined its end. Yet, even at the end, you kept steady in your conviction. Jesus, keep us steady. Jesus, keep us steady. Because Jesus, keep us steady. Amen. Jesus died a hollow death like countless before him and after him. And I find myself awkward sometimes about trying to think about what um, paying attention to this story of 2,000 years ago today means. But what does always strike me is that in marking a death by state torture and execution, we are highlighting the way within which powers used negatively will always seek the destruction of others so that they can lie and continue to speak about themselves in a way that narrates themselves as agents of life rather than agents of manipulation. To speak about um, the life of Jesus of Nazareth like this is a form of protest and is a form of deepening fortitude in the heart in the hope that uh, we might be able to live in a way that can emulate this when we are being persecuted and when we are persecuting others, recognizing the call of love. 
if the cross does empire does anything it shows that empires will always seek to go in one way and that the witness of this strange man of nazareth is to resist empire with truth and love even if it kills you because when enough people do this even hell might be paid and emptied go to hell he is called to hell this man he is called to glory he knows well those twisted ways and those who've lost their story he is called to clay this man he is called to yearning he has heard of hidden streams that heal those tired of burning he's searching out those raised in hell he wants to know the things they know he believes in dreamland where the ragged people go he is called to quiet now he is called to silence to squat down on the breaking ground with those who've swallowed violence he is called to anguished thoughts he is called to flowers to find in hell's own lonely fury that which no flame devours i saw him on the midway path i saw he carried two things only on his trip to hell this man he is called to story 